can you talk a little bit about what training was like in those early days with Yogananda? With Yogananda. It was a very personal thing. He, you know, he didn't have rules. It was much more the individual disciple. His way of leading people was if they opened up and were ready to take what he had to give, he'd give it. If he tried and they didn't take it, he didn't give. And so I found that, well, there was a special relationship I had with him. Whenever there was a group of us, he was always talking directly to me. And I had been with him less than a year when he put me in charge of all the monks. But even then, his training was uh, never do this, do that, do the other. He depended on our inner attunement. The more we were in tune, the more we would give. But usually it would mean, and this is in fact the meaning of the guru. The guru, you know, there are gurus in India who don't speak. They're monis, perpetual silence. How can they be gurus? I read something in the, in the Times of India to the effect that nowadays who needs gurus? We've got bookshops, we've got libraries, we can read all sorts of books. That's not what the guru is. The real teaching of the guru is his, his training of your consciousness. It says in the Bible, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And that power that is transferred from the guru to the disciple this depends on the disciples' openness, too. But the more open you are, the more you can receive. And so, whereas Yogananda in public would talk a lot about techniques and methods and attitudes and so on, to us he stressed again and again the importance of be in tune. Through that attunement you receive a certain understanding that, that comes from within. I remember one occasion when <clears throat> he was talking to some of the monks about potholes that had to be put in the road on the driveway there to, um, because of the heavy rains down there. And uh, I wasn't involved in that work, so I was just sitting there meditating. And I felt, even while he was talking about such a mundane thing as filling in potholes, I felt this bliss overwhelming me. And I realized that was, what he was, that was his real teaching. His uh, teaching was from inside also. Um, I mean in this way, that he knew every thought, I think. He does now. But many times if I had a thought that needed correction, and I didn't have any wrong thoughts, but I might have, all his teaching with, of me particularly was for how to help other people. And uh, one time, for example, we were at a bar mitzvah and I was to demonstrate the yoga asanas, the postures in Beverly Hills. And all of the people there were Jewish. Bar Mitzvah is a Jewish ceremony. And uh, they were all psychiatrists and that kind of very skeptical people. There's nothing more atheistical than a Jewish psychiatrist, as far as I know. That's a, a cavalier statement, which I won't back up with any facts. But I got into a discussion with one of these men. And uh, he was a complete atheist and just trying to tease me about my belief in yoga and all this changing your conscious stuff. And so I, to try to convince him, told him a few things that my, I had witnessed of my guru's miracles, miracles and so on. And uh, I could see him sort of thinking, well, let's see, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, I could see this patient. <laughs> in other words, he thought I was crazy. Well, I was uh, giving... Master had me give, demonstrate the yoga postures for guests when he had them. And uh, I, a couple of days later, I was with him and I served him lunch with his guests and did some yoga postures. And after they left, he sat at the table with me. I sat with him, rather. And uh, he said, by the way, when you're with skeptical, atheistical people, don't talk about miracles. I said, you knew. He said, I know every thought you think. And he proved it to me. Because many times he would relate to me in such a way that maybe other people at present wouldn't know, but I would know. For instance, I used to pray to him, help me, teach me to love you as, the way, as much as you love me. And he looked at me and said, 
How can a little cup hold the whole ocean? Well, only I could understand that, but it related exactly to what I'd been doing. And again and again, he showed that he knew my thoughts. He was working from inside me, not outside. And that is the true relationship of the disciple to the guru, that the guru works on you. He, you are his clay, you might say, and he molds you. And you just find yourself changing in his company so that your old tendencies fall away and finally cease to even be things you remember well.